What's up guys, Matt Davis here with Final Rise. Wanted to make a quick video, not only on reloading TSS, but hopefully providing a little information uh, that kind of points you in the right direction. You know, this was something that was new to me a little over a year ago, as I wanted to add kind of, I guess, another step in the process. There's a lot of really good manufacturers out there that are, you know, making custom hand loads. There's Apex Ammunition, there's Verdict Ammunition, Boss, Venaria, um, that whole that whole market has kind of blown up as people have obviously realized the potential and capabilities of Tungsten Super Shot. Again, I just added this because it's an additional step in the process. I enjoy doing it myself. Yes, I could go buy a box and it would maybe save me more money in the long run, but I like doing it myself. It's kind of kind of like tying your own flies or building your own arrows. It's just another step in the process that brings a little more gratification and satisfaction when you're successful. I've already gone through kind of the load development process and dialed in, um, you know, my gun, my choke, shot size, all those different things to find a combination of those multiple variables to create the hunting pattern that I am specifically looking for. Um, so this is the pattern from these 28 gauge holes that I'm going to reload. Um, really, really nice pattern. This is a uh, nine shot. I'm shooting this out of a TriStar Raptor G2 um, with their standard stock choke, with, I th which I believe is a 520 constriction. And this was shot at 40 yards. And so that's a fantastic pattern. Um, I've, I've shot a lot of 410. I have a 410 pattern here that I reload. Um, I just got back from California, had some great success, uh, killed a couple birds out there. 40 yards is pushing it for a 410, but the gun is capable. That's kind of an example of, uh, of an appropriate hunting load for what I'm looking for. Anyways, wanted to give you examples of kind of what this is able to do. I like the 410, I like the 28, not a, not a ton of recoil. They're not gonna beat you up like a three inch out of a 12 gauge or three inch out of a 20 gauge. Not that you know recoil is a big deal, but if you have youth or your wife or whatever, it's kind of fun and it's fun to kind of set some of those limitations. I'm definitely not saying a, a 28 gauge is limiting me in any way, shape or form because it just flat out performs. I shoot a lot of 28 gauge, primarily upland hunting as well. I reload all my, all my own stuff for that. And so, like I said, this was just another fun step to add to the process. So jumping in, you're going to need all your components for the recipe. Now I'm not going to share specifics in this video out of respect for the people that have done the testing and paid the money to develop the load. Most guys that you'll buy your shot from are going to have that load data. I buy my shot from Hal Abbott. Uh, I believe his website is Super 18 Tungsten or Super Tungsten 18, one of those. And, and you're able to go on, you're able to buy it in pound increments. I've got these loaded. Hal sends them to you in a bag, but I put them in these little vials. This is this is what two pounds of tungsten looks like. This is like half a semester's tuition worth of college right here. <laughs> uh, it, it's expensive. You know, it's going to run, run you around 50 bucks uh, for a pound, depending on where you're getting that at. But that's another one of the reasons that I like shooting sub gauges because I don't have to put a ton of shot in there, right? A 12 gauge shooting two ounces of TSS, that's a lot of TSS. So you're spending more money to put that into that component where out of my 410s, I shoot a seven eighth ounce which obviously performs. And then out of the 28 gauge, that's an ounce and three eighth, um, which, is, which is pretty common. There are ounce and five eighths load out there, ounce and a halfs. Um, but, but I'm not gonna shoot more, more pellets than I need to if I can create more shells and be able to go hunt a little bit more. That's, uh, that's my end goal. So anyways, you're gonna need the recipe and then obviously you need all the components to support that. I've got my holes, I've got my wads, I've got my overshot cards. Um, this recipe does call for buffer and then I've got my specific powder here. So um, where to find some of these components? So holes, a lot of the reloading stuff is super tough to get right now. I'll be honest, especially in a lot of these sub gauges. Um, I paid probably more than I should have to get these 410 holes, but I wanted them. So I paid for them. Um, 28 gauge, a little bit more available. Um, uh, ballistic solutions, uh, precision reloading. Um, trying to remember the name of the company in Wyoming, Prairie something or the other. Um, those are kind of the three places that I've had the best luck finding some of those components. Um, so you're able to get the holes. They're going to come primed. 
Um, they have them in different brass heights. They have, you know, Cheddite or Fiocchi's, whatever that is. Um, and so you just have to make sure that you get the right hole for it. I mean, you guys probably know how to use Google, plug in two, two and three quarter inch uh, Cheddite or Fiocchi hole. It's going to pull that up and hopefully they're available to you. Um, most tungsten super shot or TSS loads, excuse me, um, are going to use a TPS wad. It is a thicker wad. Tungsten, it is a lot more dense than lead, hence the performance and why you're able to shoot smaller shot size, um, you know, have a higher pattern density and then be able to have the, the energy at distance to be able to, you know, ethically kill birds. But because it's so hard, it can be, you know, abrasive to your barrel. And so some, some, uh, some particular loads may call for mylar, which is like a thin plastic piece in addition to the wad. And that's basically just to protect your barrel. But um, TPS wads, once upon a time, they were a little, re little more readily available. Um, I actually got these from a good friend this summer. Um, oh, I think his Instagram is the 28 gauge blog. And I'm forgetting his name, super good dude, but he sent me out a handful of these and I'm glad he did because I've been reloading my 410s for a while, but I decided I wanted to do the 28s this year. And by the time I got around to it, obviously all the major manufacturers were, re were reloading and I have not been able to order them myself. So fortunately I had 50 of those and was able to get those on hand. Um, then overshot cards, uh, you're gonna need that. Um, most of these loads, there are a few that are fold crimped, but primarily they're going to be roll crimped. Uh, so to be able to do a roll crimp, you can either have a hand tool that you can do that with, or you can choose a, a drill press of some sort. Um, Harbor Freight makes, makes you know, a fairly inexpensive one. I think I got this little Wen off of Amazon. I think it was, you know, 70, 80 bucks. And I, I'd bought it for other things. I do other things with it, but fortunately had it to be able to use for my reloading. Um, you're going to need something to hold your shell, a shell vise. Um, this one is from Ballistic Products. Um, Precision Reloading has one as well. And there's a handful of guys that are just making them. You can find them, I think, heck, I think you can find them on Etsy if you wanted to. And then you've got to be able to have your roll crimping tool. Um, and that is gauge specific. I've got the 28 gauge on here, but I've got a, a 410 as well. I will say there's a lot of different roll crimpers out there. And bar none, the gape rollers that that's G A E P gape rollers. And I get those from ballistic products or you can buy them uh, specifically from, um, gape the company. It's an Italian company. They produce the best results that I've had, um, out the gate. I was a little frustrated. You know, I would, I would, I've bought ballistic products. I've bought the precision reloading one. And I think those work pretty good on a lot of the 12s and 20s. And even they worked okay on the 28s. But on the 410s, just because that hole is so small, um, I just wasn't having great luck. I was just getting really um, lacking crimps, uh, where now, um, you know, that gape is, it's, it's worth spending the money. They're about 50 bucks, um, but you're going to be a lot happier with the finished product. It's going to look like a factory roll. And that's, I mean, right out the gate. You're not going to have to condition it. You're not going to have to sacrifice a hole. Um, you're not going to have to go through constantly heating that up, whatever that is. There's kind of a process and we'll talk a little bit about that, but just bar none, get a gape. You're going to really enjoy that. It's, it's, it's going to be money well spent if you're serious about getting into this and where some of these components are harder to get, nobody wants to pay more than they should for holes and wads and shot and all that stuff and have an ugly shell. And honestly, if it's an inconsistent roll crimp, you could have potential pressure differences, which is going to result in different or more sporadic patterns. You're not gonna shoot a consistent pattern. You know, it's one thing to be able to go up and shoot a piece of paper and say, hey, this is what the shell did. I'll shoot three shells to make sure that it's producing a consistent result. I'm not gonna base my hunting season or a potential opportunity on the success of one shell. Um, and that's because I'm, I'm making them. I would probably trust the factory ones to be a little more consistent. So what we're going to do here is some of the other tools that are useful to have. Um, this is like a dental, uh, little vibrating, like tool cleaner type thing. Um, it'll turn on and it'll vibrate. And if you're using any shot buffer, um, and the shot buffer is basically used to adjust the, the shot column inside of the wad, you usually want your shot to be level with the top of the wad. 
And so you're using that buffer to fill in some of that additional space and to fill that hole out so that it's going to pressurize appropriately, it's going to crimp appropriately and obviously perform. And so you'll need that. We'll show that in action here in a little bit. You obviously need to have a scale. Have a good scale. Hornady makes a, a handful of different ones. There are you know pocket sized ones. I think I have another one here in my toolkit. I've got this little one. Um, I bought a little bit larger one. It works under my powder thrower. So I use that when I'm reloading boxes of shells, um, but I use it for this. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you calibrate the unit frequently, make sure that it's accurate. Some of these loads are right at the threshold of, of pressure ratings. You know, certain gauges are pressure rated up to a certain amount of pressure. And so you wanna make sure that um, everything kind of falls in this compliant in there. So having your scale accurate to measure the appropriate amount of powder is, is very necessary and I would not recommend deviating from the recipe that you get from people. So good scale and a couple other useful things. I mean, I have a turkey striker here. This is nice for being able to kind of just push my wads in. I could do it over on one of the mechs, but a lot of times I just do this on my kitchen counter. This isn't a uh, fast process. It's not, it's not like I'm trying to load a box of shells. Usually once I figure out a load and have a gun dialed in, I'll build five shells. I mean, the likelihood of me being able to go shoot five birds in the season is pretty minimal unless we got a lot of traveling and we're doing a bunch of stuff. So usually, you know, five or six shells are going to last me an entire season. I would recommend also, this is kind of funny, but this is a little reloading block. Nothing will make you more sad than tipping over a shell of TSS in your kitchen floor and hearing all those pellets go scattering across the ground. That's a, that's a sad moment in time. Um, you know, obviously because of the cost. And so these little, these little uh, shell holders are really nice. And I like to use them for organization as well, right? You know, I've kind of got everything staged. I have a couple finished shells here, but you know, once I throw powder in, I can move it back. So that way I'm not potentially loading two, two loads of primer into it. You want to make sure you're being methodical. You're paying attention to this. And so I can just move these holes back and forth and I can load a wad. And it just helps me stay organized and make sure that I know where every shell at is in that, uh, in that reloading process. Highly recommend getting a hold of Hal. Um, again, great customer service. He's a small business like us, like supporting guys like that. And so help him out if you can. All right, so the first thing we're going to do, obviously, anytime you're reloading a shot shell, at the very bottom of that hole, you're going to need to load powder. And so it's gonna go powder and then it's gonna go wad if you have to use a filler or you have to use anything, you know, a cork spacer or something like that. Again, we're trying to make sure that the shot as it is in that wad is up to height and that it's flush across the top. That way, when you put the overshot card on and you roll crimp it down, everything's very condensed. It's not going to shake. It's not going to rattle. You're not going to hear noise. So um, we'll load up some powder. We'll load the wad and kind of just show you the process we go through. This isn't, uh, it's not rocket science by any means, but following the steps to a T is gonna keep you safe during the reloading process. So we're gonna hop in and start doing that. Uh, so I've got my recipe written down here on a piece of paper because that's kind of how I am. And so I've had this scale on, I calibrated it earlier. Um, I, I usually leave my scales on for a couple minutes and let them warm up. It's early spring, I'm in my garage, which is a little bit cooler than most of my house. Um, but I'll turn it on, I'll let it warm up, I'll calibrate it. I'm not saying that you have to do that. It probably doesn't make a difference, but it makes me feel good. <laughs> and uh, I, like I said, I, I like the process as much as anything. I usually just put these in little Tupperwares. I've got some of the powder, I've got some of the buffer. Usually they're gonna come in larger containers. Um, I bought an eight pound tub of this. It's really hard to scoop into an eight pound tub and get that out. Um, so I use these little containers. And then I just have a metal spoon that I, they have scoopers and stuff like that, but I feel like I can be a little more precise. I can get the powder, I can shake it out and kind of do, do everything that I need to. So load up some powder here real quick and we'll do one hole in its entirety. And then we'll probably have some complimenting shots to kind of show you up close what those uh, individual steps look like. I know exactly how much powder I need. This is again, kind of why I like a, uh, a little kitchen spoon. I can just sit here and tap the side of it. You can use powder throwers. You can use different things like that. I just try to be, I guess, as precise as I can. Bam. Alrighty. 
So I've got the shot, the powder here, excuse me, not the shot. Tap that into that guy. Uh, one of the things I do is because there's a lot of times there can be static electricity built up and you can look down in the hole and you'll see, you know, powder particles or individual flakes. Um, usually I'll kind of just tap everything down. It's not going to make a giant difference, um, but it sure looks a lot nicer when it's all said and done. So I'll tap that powder down in. Next, you're going to want to grab one of your holes. Like I said, this is a TPS wad. This is from Ballistic Products. Really good wad. So you're going to put that in. Hopefully slide that down in where you can kind of see it. And then I take this striker and I'm going to push that down in. I've seen guys take a wad to kind of seat it, but um, you know the crimp depth on a lot of these sub gauges is very, very shallow. And so I'm trying to make sure that I have as much real estate from the top of my wad and my shot that there's enough room that I'm going to be able to roll enough material and get a really nice finished crimp. So I just take this and I put it down in. I don't push super hard on it by any means. I'm not going crazy, but I'm just making sure that that's seated, that the wad is sitting flush. Um, obviously, I want the top of my wad and the top of the hole to be as parallel as possible so that everything sits together very nicely. So we've got that in here. Um, next up, I'm going to move this over here so I don't spill it. I have shot. Um, so this is something I've seen guys do a number of different ways. And this is my way, and this is maybe a little bit quicker, I guess. Um, what, what you'll see a lot of guys do is they will load um, half of the shot and then half of the buffer, and then they'll basically vibrate that down, blend everything together, and then they're going to load the other half of the shot and the other half of the buffer. Honestly, I just I, I did it that way initially when I started. Shot, obviously shot great, but... It was kind of a back and forth and back and forth. And it's just easier for me personally just to load all the shot. And then I load the buffer in a little bit at a time, trickle it down, and it finishes the exact same produced result. Uh, zero variations in performance. And it's just easier for me, you know, if I'm in my kitchen and my dog comes running by or my wife asks me a question, it's not, I don't have to remember how much of that did I just put in or how much of that did I just put in? It's, it's, I can take those in individual steps and just be very concise in that process. So I know how much shot I need here. This particular load is an ounce and three eighths, which equates to a hundred or excuse me, 601 grains. Um, and you want to make sure on your scale, this is probably a no brainer, but I'll mention it. Make sure that it is in the grains mode that you select the unit for grain specifically. And you can go on Google, obviously an ounce and three eighths is what 1.375. Um, and then you can convert that to grains and that comes out to 601.32 something. So usually what I do here, I try to be so careful. Like I said, this stuff is not, not cheap, but I'm going to need 600 grains, 85, 85, 86. Come on. And one more pellet will put us at that 601. Put the lid back on that because, like I said, I'd be heartbroken if I lost some of this. And then I'm going to load that into the hole. Um, we'll get we'll get a close-up shot to kind of show you what this looks like as we load another shell. But there's probably three-eighths of an inch between the top of the shot, the wad, and then the top of the hole. Now we've got to load the buffer in, and as we trickle the buffer in, that's going to mix in with the shot and basically fill that volume, which will level the shot with the very top of that wad. So next, I'll put that in there. Like I said, it's, uh, it's worth having a little holder deal because it's very sad when you spill. A shell full of TSS and I'm gonna make sure this spoons cleaned off I don't need to add any more powder to it usually I have two separate spoons one for each thing but I dropped a spoon behind my toolbox and I haven't got it out so 
We've got our buffer here. There's all sorts of different buffer types out here. Uh, this particular stuff is from Precision Reloading. I think it's called uh, BSP is the name of it. And so now we've got our buffer and it is just weird stuff. Almost feels like it's like styrofoam of some sort. And like I said, normally, you know, we're doing one at a time here, but uh, normally we'll go through the process of loading multiple shells at a time. So we'll load, do all the powder in a step, load all the wads in a step, load all the shot in a step, load the buffer in a step, and then trickle through, crimp, all that stuff. So we've got that. As we pour this in, I'm only going to pour part of it in. I'm just going to pour it in until it sits flush with the top of the wad. Um, the wads are pretty sealed against the wall on the inside of the hole itself. Um, but to avoid potentially having stuff fall down in between there, I just fill it up to the very top, trickle it, add a little bit more, trickle it. And so all I'm doing is I'm going to turn this on. It might be hard to hear me and I'm going to set it on that trickler until I see the TSS or the shot start appearing at the very top. And where I have to add a bunch, I can be fairly aggressive and, you know, totally exposing the, uh, the TSS in there. And yeah, it works pretty good. So what I'll also do here is I just put my finger over the top of the hole. I do that with, um, I haven't loaded TSS for a 20 gauge, but uh, with the 28 and the 410, it's super easy. And that's going to keep all that buffer in there where, like I said, I mean, it can, it can jump out of there. So I'll just put my finger over the top, bring this little guy over. Turn him on. I'm just gonna trickle that. Usually I'll start it kind of just slow just to kind of start shaking everything and then I will uh, ramp it up a little bit and you, you can almost feel when the shot starts getting to the top of the column, you can feel the pellets trying to jump out and hit you in the top of the finger. So that kind of is like a, I guess a physical cue that it's there. Okay, I just felt. I'm going to turn that off. Now you can't see any buffer. All you can see is shot, but the shot is now higher to the top of the hole. And so we're starting to fill that capacity. So now I can throw a little bit more in. Go through the same process here. Just starting to peek through. Bam. Beautiful. You just want to be able to see some of that shot just peeking through or just right on top. And now the shot, the buffer, everything's blended together. And that wad, that TPS wad is completely filled. The volume of that is now all taken out. And so the next step would be, we're going to take an overshot card. Um, you can buy these pre-made or you can also just buy um, a punch kit. I use a punch kit for all my 410 stuff. I use a, an 11 millimeter and... I mean, you can take a cereal box. I think I've got like a protein bar box back there that I'll just punch a bunch of them out and just make them myself. But I don't have one for my 28 gauge and they're cheap enough. You know, it's 500 for a bag and I think they're maybe around 10 bucks or so. You can kind of see, it's, it's gonna be really hard to show, but from what, I guess maybe me watching too much YouTube <laughs> and from what I've seen, but looking at the wad, there is a slightly, um, what would it be convex if it's pushing out um, or domed end. There's one top of the, of the overshot wad that's very flat. And then you can almost see the white along the bottom. So I put the flat part to the top of the wad with the dome pushing down. And I believe that fills some space. Don't quote me on that but you can see the difference um, when you look at it. And I just, I learned it that way and that's what I'm telling you because I know it works. And so from there, I'm just gonna use my finger and I'm just gonna push on the top of this. And this overshot card is going to sit basically right on top of the wad. If I was to get a wad out here and kind of give you an example. Um, you know, the wad's obviously sitting inside the hole this is sitting on top of the uh, powder, your buffer and your shot are filling this up until they're level with the top. And then that overshot card is holding all of that in place, right? So that is basically going to seal the top of that. Now we're gonna have enough room that we can turn on our press, 
we can warm up that plastic and all a roll crimp is is basically melting and rolling the plastic into itself so we're at that point we've got everything um, ready to rock and roll so first thing i'll do is I'll, I'll chuck this up i have this specifically closed or set up for a 410 but i can still pinch it and hold a, a 28 gauge um, some people recommend um, using you know three in one oil i usually do that like every couple of shells um, and that's just to prevent the hole from obviously melting or burning because this is creating friction on the inside of the of the press here these there's these almost these little i guess i'll call them teeth that's probably not the correct term but those are what's creating the friction as it spins on the top of the hole and then the shape of it allows it to roll back down in and then that crimp is going to fill that space hold the overshot card um, down on top of the wad the shot and the filler so i'll turn that on here um, just in case this gets super loud usually what i'll do um, you can spec them out i mean most uh most presses have you know some type of you know depth stop measurement on there so if you want to set that you can be like super consistent I kind of just go by feel after you've done it a handful of times, you'll kind of know. And then I will slowly progress that and just let that melt its whole way down. And then it'll basically stop. Obviously there's only so much that the, the hole can give. One thing that can happen if you push down too far because you have the overshot card there, basically you're creating a lip on the side of the hole itself. And so it starts straight walled, but it will curl as the crimp is pushed down on it. If you push it too far, the, the crimp will start folding out on top of the overshot card, right? It doesn't have anywhere to go. It can't go back against itself. And so it can creep out on top of the hole. And that's when you have overpressed that. And you're probably gonna make that mistake. I did multiple times. And so you kind of know when to stop. And so I'll do that until I kind of feel it stop. And then I'll back it off and I'll kind of just push on it. I'll usually check it visually. I'll look for if there's a gap in between the top of the crimp and the, uh, and the overshot card. And if I need to put it back in the chuck and press it down a little bit more, that's okay too. I would rather progress through that and make sure that I'm finishing or producing a nice finished shell versus over crimping, which again can change, pressure can change how that shot shell is going to perform. All those little things uh, factor into this. So let's spin one up. Um, another thing to note, um, roll crimp the speed or the rpms of the crimper is important as well the other reason i like these gapes is you can spin them around you know 900 to a thousand rpms where a lot of the other roll crimpers they recommend you know right in that 700 range and so some drill presses won't go that slow the slowest this particular one goes is 900 rpms and so there's a little belt and pulley system on the inside that I can open up and adjust and change that. Um, but that roll crimp speed is important. You don't want it too fast so it's not burning or melting the plastic and that it's, but you don't want it too slow that it's not creating enough friction and it's this overly drawn out process. So you'll kind of figure out what works best for you as you spin a couple of these up. Know that you're gonna make mistakes. It may be worth just throwing some lead in there and figuring out how to roll crimp one before you roll one up with some TSS and then you're mad that you've got, you know, $2 worth of shot in there or whatever it is. So, all right. So we're gonna wanna make sure first and foremost, I've already gone through, I level all of this, making sure that the top of that crimp and the top of the hole is as flush and uniform as possible is very important. Most of the time, not all holes are perfectly flat across the top. Um, you can trim them, I don't. Um, because usually I'm going to trim them after I shoot them one time and reload them. Um, not that that would prohibit me from being able to use it again, but just make sure that everything's as level as possible. So as that crimp comes down on it, it's not, you know, hitting a crooked hole, starting to roll this before it gets to the other side. So take five extra minutes, square everything up, make sure it's good to go. And then I'm just going to put pressure on this to hold this. Obviously the, um, the roll crimper is going to want to spin this, the hole unless I hold it. And so I'll put a little pressure on there. I'll make sure that I'm lined up there. And so it just barely, it just barely stopped right here. So now I know that I'm contacting plastic, which is great. 
and I'm just gonna spin that on there for a couple seconds, I can hear it. And as I push down, you will audibly hear it spinning. It will, it will create basically a different tone. So we'll just slowly roll into that. Right there, you can hear it. So I'll slowly push. And it wanted to stop right there. So I'll back it off. I'll inspect the hole. Looks dang near perfect. I'm just going to give it one little quick bump, line it back up, come down to it again, give it a bump. Take that out. And that is as good as factory. That is absolutely perfect. A little bit of rattle if I wanted to. I could probably push down on it a little bit more. I'm not super worried about it. Most factory shells that you get will have a little bit of rattle to them. This is perfect, really nice uniform shape there. These do shoot well out of those TriStars. Um, some of those, some of those TriStars don't shoot some of the longer um, loads. And what I mean by that is certain hole lengths will vary. I mean, this is a little bit longer than a lot of the factory 28 gauge loads that I've purchased from um, Apex, Verdict. Um, some of those other guys out there, but these do cycle perfectly out of those out of those tri stars in a very lengthy way because I am long winded, but hopefully provided enough context and information where if this is something that you want to get into, hopefully we've armed you with enough information to be successful in doing it. That you're able to go get the components if you can find them. If you know somebody that has them, you can reach out. And again, this is just it's a fun additional step in the process. There's few things as gratifying as, you know, successfully killing a bird and knowing that you did it with the shell again and everything that you set up yourself. That'll be all for this video. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our channel. This is new. This is something we're kind of getting into. Turkey hunting is kind of our, our springtime passion primarily. We upland hunt, um, but, you know, we like chasing birds too. So anyways, make sure you subscribe and I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for watching.